Huasi Village, located in Jiangsu Province, is called the richest village in China. However, maybe it is common for a village to make lots of money and doesn't make Huasi so famous around the world. The village has a multi-sector industry company that is listed on the stock exchange and most importantly, all the villagers are shareholders of the company. This makes villagers share the profit of the company. According to the Huasi Authority, the wealth of its people is at least 100,000 euro dollars, while the turnover of the company was about 6.5 million in the year of 2011. The history of the village was also astonishing. By having a 25,000 deficit at the very beginning, the village now has about 28 billion yuan of economic output. In the course of development, Huasi was managed to merge with the nearby village. Through the merger, the population of the village has increased from 1.5 thousand to 30 thousand, while the village has expanded from about 1 square kilometer to 30 today. However, among the 30 thousand people, only 2,000 of them are indigenous villagers. Villagers share the fruit of the economic development of Huasi. After submitting 20% profit to the central government, the remaining will be distributed among staff, technicians, and contractors. For the staff and technician, the amount of reward is determined by the effort they paid. This is how the socialist village works. The transitional path of Huasi village is different from most other villages in China since it did not really adopt the household responsibility system. This was probably due to its existing industrial base which required collective production. Nevertheless, it still took advantages of opening up and market reform policies to boost its economic wow. growth. He had double identities the party head at the village and the leader of village business. He played an extremely important role in the governance structure of Huasi village. His family controlled most of the top position in the village and it was rumored that 90.7% of the available fund was in the hands of four sons or son-in-law of Wu Bao. Outside criticism and suspects of this family controlled business burst out when Wuren Bao decided to pass his power to his younger son in 2003. However, a vice party secretary of Huasi village argues that the village is truly democratic in the sense that 53% of those party representatives are non-locals. The so-called democracy he describes actually means collective decision making among only over 100 high-ranked CCP members who are selected by Wuren Bao rather than elected by villagers. In terms of ideology, Huasi village portrayed itself as an exemplar of common prosperity and socialism. Wuren Bao was an expert in handling the relationship with government. A lot of Chinese top leaders visited Huasi village and praised its achievement. As a comparison, Yu Zhuomin, the party head of Da Qiu Zhuang got arrogant after spectacular economic progress of his village and he offended local government, confronted with policemen, and finally got arrested. And Wu Bao was good at capitalizing on Hua Xi's intangible asset. He used the village's reputation to ask for special treatment from the government and gain support from villagers who get ideal interests such as glory and pride. Although Huasi village is not democratic at all, villagers are generally satisfied with the authority of Wu Bao. The loyalty to him or his family is seen as a societal norm. Wu Bao respected villagers and refused to enjoy the best villa or the highest salary at the village. Villagers trust Wu Bao because both of his business abilities and his personality as a role model. The key problem is whether the trust and paternalistic governance can sustain after this charismatic leader passed away in 2013. Another institutional factor that allows Huasi village to be claimed as one of the richest villages in China is the historical context of China's economic reform and its economic model. Huasi Dong's socialist ideology showing weaknesses with severe shortage of consumption goods. One of the economic reform in 1980s was Township and Villages Enterprises or TVEs.
These are small manufacturing operations led by local communist party official with a collective ownership structure but also capitalistic and market-driven in nature. Each village would raise monetary resources from profits or loans from banks and produce industrial equipment and pay taxes to the state. CVEs gradually became competitive between each other and eventually also with state-owned enterprises. Output grew average rate of 30% per year and export at 65% and at its peak contributed 38% to GDP of China. TVEs were vital to economic reform in China as the competition forced state-owned enterprises to become more efficient while developing entrepreneurship and private sector in China. Huasi village followed the model used commonly throughout southern Jiangxi province where the government played a more essential role and in the case of Huasi, Wu Renbao decided to steer away from farming to manufacturing. When Wu Renbao set up a village-owned textile factory during the peak of cultural revolution when accumulation of capital other than from central planning was illegal, and would have been considered capitalistic at that time. During the economic reform in 1980s, the transition to manufacturing intensified and built various types of businesses and factories, while more goods were starting to be exported, including steel, chemicals, and tobacco. Starting from a generic rural agricultural commune, today it is considered one of the richest villages in China. Since 1998, the village became the first commune to be listed in the stock exchange, while today the villagers are major shareholder of the hybrid of a socialist village and a multi-billion dollar conglomerate as they receive one-fifth of the profit. One of the most recent developments in Huasi village is a 328 meter tall landmark skyscraper of Longsi International Hotel built to celebrate 50th anniversary. This is a sign that due to unsustainability and growingly ineffective steel and textile industry, the village is diversifying to tourism industry with an estimated 2 million visitors each year. In fact, while it once contributed to nearly half of the annual profit of the village, the increasing cost and national overproduction greatly reduced the profit with now only contributing to less than a third while steel and textile combined a loss of 200 million yuan. Moving on to the social institution of Huasi village, ancient Chinese values including loyalty, collectivism, and hard work are strictly followed by the villagers. Despite of the villagers' several capitalistic aspects, it has successfully adopted the socialist ideology, forming a new unique culture of Huasi. One of the social characteristics of Huasi village that stands out is loyalty. Villagers show ultimate respect to Wu Renbao and the Chinese Communist Party. This unconditional trust to the village headquarters and CCP leads the villagers to have a big pride in the city that they live in. The village anthem that praises the CCP value is played in the village on a regular basis, and some villagers even declare that Huasi is the best city to live in the China or even in the world. Due to their satisfaction of living in Huasi, villagers do not have a concept of greed. Indeed, they believe that there are only five aims in life, money, a car, a house, a son, and respect, and most of them are provided by the village. In order to sustain the privileges the villagers get, Huasi village emphasizes the idea of collectivism. The village strictly forbids villagers from vandalizing communal properties through harsh laws and phrases and murals are posted all around the village to encourage villagers to take care of their family and neighbors. In fact, collectivism is the most important value in Huasi village as most of the materialistic factors are provided by the village itself. With the socialistic values in mind, villagers work extremely hard because they believe that their individual sacrifices by following the party's order will eventually create 
a collective benefit for the whole. The working ethics of the Pasi villagers are truly spectacular. Unlike any other place in the world, people in Pasi village work seven days a week. Some might say that it is insane to work without a single day off, but the belief and the mindset of the villagers make the impossible possible. One major motivation to the Pasi villagers is the belief of guaranteed success. As human beings, the fear of failure is one of the major hindrances that we face. However, in 1969, when Wurrumbao first made a textile factory in Pasi village, the villagers experienced a success that they never had experienced before. From then, the belief that they will succeed has motivated the villagers to work hard and gain wealth in the end. Another major motivation that the villagers have is the concept of unity. Since their wealth is strictly shared and constrained to the village community, the villagers are aware that they can only succeed together. Thus, the feeling of responsibility pushes them forward towards success. Another prominent reason the whole world lays its eyes upon Kwasi is the benefits that the locals receive for their work, ranging from free cooking oil and education to a free car, house and healthcare. The material benefits that the Kwasi local villagers get to enjoy is something that many people only dream of in this world. In order for every local village member to luxuriate in all the benefits, the workers must also endure some of the constraints that the Huasi requires. As said before, the workers have to work seven days a week. Furthermore, although it is true that the villagers in Huasi are nominally richer than other people elsewhere, it is also true that they have less time and freedom to spend their money. Bars and restaurants close before 10 p.m. so the workers do not sleep late and holidays are scarce. Even if the villagers have money, their way of using it is extremely limited. Finally, villagers get little cash from their paper assets, 80% of their annual bonus and 95% of their dividend must be reinvested into the community in order for the quasi village to continue its wealth. This means that if the villagers of Huasi live Huasi, then their wealth will disappear. Out of 30,000 villagers in Huasi, about 28,000 of them are migrant workers. Even though the migrant workers receive a similar amount of salary compared to the local villagers, they do not get the benefits that the villagers get. It is almost impossible for those migrant workers to get Huasi Hu Ko as the village strictly controls the number of their villagers so that the few number of villagers can get the privileges of socialism. Traditionally, Huasi focused primarily on low-tech manufacturing industries such as textile, food, and steel industry, but recently it put massive resources on tourism and finance industry. A representative symbol is its 328-meter high skyscraper. In addition, pressure towards manufacturing industry and for waste management is rising with, as for example, five chemical and textile factories were forced to shut down due to dumping waste into its local river and their inabilities to meet environmental standards. Quasi Miracle, so far, has been very successful and has been an outstanding model for many other cities in China. Yet other villages and cities could not be easily duplicated due to its unique form of agriculture-based society that encouraged people to work hard without strong materialistic need and lack of tremendous support from the government. Besides, Huasi village had a relatively stronger industrial base even before the 1978 reform and a post-collectivism culture under which villagers are tightly linked. However, how long would it be able to sustain its progress? Since the last few years, Huasi village has encountered with three big challenges, environmental, economic, and political issues. As environmental is a very sensitive issue in China, executives of Huasi village must pay special attention to its environmental issues. Since most of its major industries are heavy industries such as steel, chemicals, and tobacco, the environment is polluted extensively. 
In order to maintain its title, The Perfect Village, Huasi must develop strong environmental policies to reduce the pollution. Moreover, as the village has been heavily relying on manufacturing industries, it is vulnerable to economic downturns. In fact, manufacturing industries are not as profitable as they were before. Since all the privileges the villagers get from the village comes from its immense economic power, Huasi must find alternative industries to make profits that it has been making for the last few decades. Lastly, Huasi village must be able to maintain its good relationship with the CCP and among different stratifications of villagers. Ever since Wura Bao has come to power, the village kept a close-knit relationship with the CCP. However, it is suspicious whether his son could maintain this political asset after Wu Rambao's demise. More importantly, will villagers still trust Wu's family? Or will they eventually get frustrated by enlarging inequalities in terms of political power and economic benefits? If the Huasi village can overcome these challenges, there is a high chance that it can maintain its prosperity. However, considering the amount of effort and time that are needed to be spent on these issues, it seems that it is very difficult to sustain the village's wealth.